Okay. Welcome everyone. If um, you're not muted, please mute yourself now so that uh, we can get the program started. All right. Hi, my name is Denise Reagan, and I am so happy to have you all here for Horticulture Corner. What's my plant? Um, if you're like me and you really um, struggle in this area, you're about to get a great um, first lesson in uh, plant identification. Um, so first I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Denise Reagan. I'm the executive director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And I'm here with Daniel Stark, our operations manager, who is handling camera and audio and many other duties. And we are here through a generous um, grant from the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, which is making virtual and hybrid programs like this possible. I'd also like to thank Wally Eriks, our Horticulture Corner Chair, who uh, probably checked you in today if you are here in person. Thank you, Wally. And if you're not a member of the Garden Club, it's a really great opportunity to join us. We have so many programs coming up that um, are really worthwhile and uh, there's a great incentive to, um, to join because many of these programs, um, unlike horticulture, which is free, do have a fee if you are not a member or a larger fee if you're not a member. And so we'd really love to have you. And that uh, link is going to go up on Zoom now. And, uh, and it's on our website if uh, you're here in person. All right. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, one of our speakers today. We actually have um, a really great trifecta of uh, master gardeners here. But our lead master gardener is Nancy Traver. Nancy has been a master gardener since 2014. She first became interested in becoming a master gardener through her work with the Greater Jacksonville Agricultural Fair, where she was a member for more than 20 years. She was fascinated by all the displays and exhibits presented by UF IFAS Extension Office. She met so many people through that event and wanted to learn more. Nancy grew up in dairy country in upstate New York. Her father sold farm equipment. Back then, she could and did grow everything. But she found little success, even with a simple, simple vegetable garden here in Florida. Being a master gardener has helped her transition from a northern climate gardener to a southern climate gardener. She still misses some of the spring flowers that find it too hot to thrive in Florida, but she enjoys being able to garden year round in Jacksonville. So please welcome Nancy Traver. And I also wanna give a little shout out to our two other master gardeners who are gonna be here for the Q&A portion. Terry Devalier, who is a retired UF IFAS Extension agent, and Aileen Clement, who's a master gardener and a member of the Garden Club and the Wildflower Circle. And we're so happy to have both of them here. And they're gonna be answering your questions at the end, which if you have questions, please save them to the end. If you're on Zoom, you can go ahead and put them in the chat and we will um, get to them at the end of the program. And if you're here in person, we have a microphone that Daniel will pull out and uh, you can go ask your question there because we wanna make sure we get it recorded uh, for posterity and uh, so that it can be part of the recording that we put up on the website later. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nancy and Nancy, take it away. Good morning, everybody. And I have to tell you that this is October and my strawberry plants are growing. I'm gonna have strawberries for Christmas. Being from the North, that's a really unusual thing for me, but I finally figured it out. So we have a new horticultural agent, Tanya Ashworth. She was going to join us today, but she was called to Gainesville, so you're stuck with me. But that's okay, we'll get through this. Next slide, please. I'm sure that you all know who we are and what we do. We're with the Extension Office. We provide horticultural information to the community and a whole lot more. We talk about trees. We have Farm Agent Bureau part. We have just so much going on. We own the City Canning Center, or at least we run it now. We don't own it, but we still teach canning. We do so much. We 4 H is there. We use workshops, lectures like this, Zoom classes because of COVID. We do demonstrations and we come out and speak in public. We have master gardeners in the office to answer phone calls when you have a question, something you can't identify, something's eating your plant, whatever you need, just call the extension office. 
And having been on phone duty myself, I really encourage you to call because it gets really lonesome when the phone doesn't ring. <laughs> That's what we're there for. So today we're going to just briefly do some plant identification and tell you how we as master gardeners identify our plants. And then we're going to give you an easy way for you to identify plants. And again, if you can't, call the office because you can even send us an email with a picture and we can work with that. We have tools that we use. Obviously, we have books. We have plant keys. We have a wonderful computer system that's run by the university down in Gainesville. And it's been modernized this year. It's now like Google. So if you go into edis.ifas.ufl.edu, it pops up with a screen that says, ask me. And you type in your question and it gives you an answer. Or at least it will give you choices of answers. And then you have to kind of work your way down through them to get your answer. Today, we're going to do something a little out of schedule, and I'm going to teach you how to use your cell phone to get some of those answers. So if we could have the next slide, we're going to talk about Google Lens. Most phones that have the Google app in them have Google Photos built in. I didn't even know it was in my phone until Tanya showed me where to find it. You can take a picture, and you're going to open it in that Google Photo app. And when you've got the picture open in the app, you're going to press this little lens button down at the bottom of the screen, and it's going to try to identify that plant. Now, sometimes it doesn't get it right the first time. Sometimes it doesn't get it right the second time. You have to be a little persistent. But Google does an internet search for the plant, and then it comes back with the options that are closest to the picture that you took. Then you can kind of use that to filter down through and find your plant. And I'm going to repeat that same old phrase. If you can't get it for sure, call the office. We're going to tell you a little bit about identifying some plants by their characteristics to help you get to an answer. Um, there are plants in the same family that have things in common, which will get you to down through that filter. So you can ask Google, what's my plant with that picture? It might come back with the right answer, it might not. But if you can take the time and look at some of the features of the plant, you can help work that down by yourself. One of the things you can look for is the stem itself. Is it round? Is it square? Is it triangular? And yes, there are some that are triangular. Plants with square stems are usually mints. Now mints, you can also tell by just breaking that leaf and taking a hint you know, just a whiff of that mint. It's not going to tell you exactly which one, but it's going to tell you that it's a mint. And then you can, again, work your way down through to see if it's a chocolate mint, a spearmint mint, peppermint mint. There's a whole lot of things in the mint family. But once you get to that defined point that you know it's a mint, you've gotten half the battle done. Can we have the next slide, please? These plants are all in the same family, but they're all different. Doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> but they're all in the mint family. When we're identifying plants at the office, we are identifying them by the scientific name, not the common name, because the common name doesn't tell us exactly what it is like the scientific name does. If you can get to that point, you're doing as good as a master gardener. Isn't that right, Terry? She's over there kind of listening in. Um, but at least if you get to mint, then you can again start drilling down to find out what mint, how to use the mint, which are all things that we help you with in the office too. I'm not gonna read off all the names of the pictures up there. Um, I think you can all see them clearly, thanks to some little help we had this morning. Can I have the next slide? It gets difficult when you get into some of the other plants that don't have much of a stem. And you have to figure out exactly what it is or get close so that you can get closer to what you think it is. Um, these both, they look totally different. They're both in the same family. They're in the Crassula family, which is a word that 
you might want to look up, I'll spell it for you, C-R-A-S-S-U-L-A. -S -S and then you can see all the variations of that plant. If we could have the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about the stems. And I'm going to talk about that white milky sap because I'm allergic to it. And be very careful when you break them over, open. If you have a latex allergy, you're going to be allergic to almost every white milky sap plant that's out there. And I'm hearing a chuckle over in the corner because someone else has that same allergy as I do. And I found out the hard way. I was pulling weeds and not looking at what I was pulling. And the next day, my hands were bright red. And I had to go ask what I had done. And I had touched too much of that sap. For me, it's like poison ivy is to most people. We talk about these being a euphorbia, or maybe it's not. But it's, it's really kind of sometimes confusing when you're trying to identify plants in a hurry. That's why we gave you the cheat. And I do have it on my phone. I can help anybody with it afterwards and show you how to get to that app and how to use it on your phone. For those of you on Zoom, um, you can call. We can help you a little bit with it. It's really very easy. Just go to your Google app, and you're going to find that in there. Even though you don't think you have it, you probably do. They give it to us whether we want it or not. If we can have the next slide. These are plants that you're going to recognize, especially the rubber tree. Okay, it's a latex plant. It has that white milky sap. Everybody goes, no. Banana trees do too. It's a white latex plant. They're all related, including the figs. They all have that white sap. It's hard to believe so many things are related and yet so different. That's why we try and get the scientific name. And if we can have the next slide. Another indicator that you can use. I know you all know violets. I think most all of us grow violets either in the house or somewhere else out in the yard. Mine don't do well either place. I'm going to admit it. Um, velvet leaves, fuzzy leaves. The leaves tell you a lot. The shape of the leaf tells you a lot. The biggest thing is if you can get a hold of a plant key and start using that plant key, like we do this with a tree. We have a tree book, and it starts with simple questions. And for every question, think of the old flow charts we probably all did in high school at some point, where if it's this, it's yes, and if it's that, it's no. A plant key will do the same thing for you and walk you through all those different things to get to your result. The leaves, like with the African violets, the gloxinias, the lipstick plant, they're all from the same family, which is, and I can't say this word, so don't laugh at me, just center it, is as close as I can get. They're, they're the same, and they're different. And if we can go to the next slide, we talk a little bit more about leaves, skinny leaves, long leaves, fat leaves, triangular-shaped leaves. That's all things you look at with that plant key to want to narrow things down. Now, an aloe is pretty simple to tell because you know you break it open and that nice little stuff comes out and you can use it for burns and all kinds of wonderful things. It's used in a lot of hand lotions. So the agaves are all in the same family, but then each plant has its own characteristics. And the next slide is still talking about the leaves. The lily family has parallel veins, just like in the last so slide, some of the agaves have parallel leaves. The spider plant has parallel leaves. So again, we're looking for scientific name before we go to plant name, because you could think it's one thing and it's really something else if you just tell us it's it looks like a spider plant. Well, it may not be because you haven't gotten all the way down to what we do when we're doing this on the, in the books or on the laptop. When we're in the office on the phones, we have a laptop and we can go straight to the computer in Gainesville and get answers. Um, I recently did a class where someone asked about a worm and I ended up going to the Minnesota website through IFS, which was wonderful and got his answer. So he didn't have to wait. And if we could have the next slide. 
plants in the palm valley family have parallel veins. So if you're confused, think of the confusion we go through when we're learning all this and we're supposed to be able to identify something like 100,000 plants. We have books, <laughs> we have computers, and we have each other. We have a lot of help. And if we could go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about flowers and begonias. Everybody here pretty broad, probably raises begonias. I tried that too, and I wasn't very good. But I'm learning more about them because I'm learning that there are three groups of begonias when I thought there was just a begonia. It's a begonia. It is a begonia. And I didn't like them, probably because I couldn't grow them. There are some that spread by rhizomes, which go under the ground. There are some that send out top roots. And they're confusing. So again, we go to the books and the computer, pick up the phone, call me. I think we're ready for the next slide. I'm sorry that this is going to be kind of a short presentation, but we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions and answers. And I hope everybody on Zoom is getting your questions ready. I know we have a couple people here live that brought their plants so we can help identify them. This slide talks about the flowers themselves and how to tell things apart. But again, I have wonderful handouts that tell me what, how to drill down further into some of the types of things based on the leaf. The app is going to help you with that. Our website is going to help you with that so that you can tell the difference between pothos, peace lilies. One of the ones that get confused quite often is the air potato plant, which is invasive but it has leaves that look just like some of the house plants. So there's a lot more to plant identification than just the few minutes that we, we have dedicated to going through this. It's more about we're here to take questions. If you have something specific in front of you, you can't identify if you're at home and can take a picture of it and somehow get it so we can see the picture or send it to the office so that we can see it, then we'll help with that. I'm also here to help a little bit for anybody who has questions about the fair because I really was over there for like 26 years and I was the arts and crafts chairperson. I know all about how to fill out those forms. So I think we're about ready to go to the question and answer. I'm going to invite Terry and Aileen to come up, um, open the board for questions. I know that there's at least one person in the room who has plants with her. And if any of you have specific questions and you want us to go into a little more detail than what we did in the slide presentation, and again, anybody who wants me to show them how to use the app that's here in the room, I'll be more than happy to. We'll just re-mask up or I'll mask back up. Um, I brought wipes so I can clean the phone in between for anybody that wants to touch it and try it. And I'm bringing up the experts because if, if Terry can't identify it, I'm in real trouble. <laughs> so any questions well i'll go ahead and ask a question uh while people are getting warmed up okay um so what are a couple of the most um, difficult plants that you've ever had to identify oh where do i begin succulents are difficult and what makes them so difficult I have two books. I have two books up here that are excellent. Uh, if you know Jim Love, he used to, to be at um, the University Ace Hardware. He was he is Mr. Succulent uh, in this in this particular community. He's also in the Men's Garden Club, and uh, he suggested these two books to me, and I have have never regretted buying them. I get all of my books on as used books on uh, Google on on sorry Amazon. And you can get them for a fraction of the price of a new book. And they usually, they'll tell you if it's very good or like new or, you know, and, and you'll pay a slight, it's usually a pretty straightforward $3.99 shipping fee. But um, 
books, they vary in prices. Some of them are, would cost 70 or $80 new, and you can get them a quarter of that price, generally. I will also say that orchids are getting very difficult to identify because the market has been flooded with false orchids that are coming out of China. And if you see them on that big box store online, it starts with a letter A, be very leery because you may be getting a false orchid. I know I've come here and seen some of the most gorgeous orchids during the orchid show. And it's another one of those that I was always told are so difficult to grow and I have found out they're not. But now with the new breeds of stuff that's coming in, they may not be a true orchid. They may be like, they look like one. I know I saw one and I asked somebody about it and its nickname is Little Man. And it looks like a little Chinese man with this coolie hat on. And it's really not a true orchid. It's just something that somebody has crossbred off an orchid and they're selling it as orchids. So orchids can be difficult too. All right, and it looks like Brenda is gonna come up with a question. Thank you, Brenda. I want to, um, let me enunciate clearly. I want to know, how do you tell a seedling chinaberry tree from a seedling golden rain tree? I've had people leave chinaberry trees growing thinking they were gonna get a golden rain tree. And <laughs> yeah, please use the mic. Very invasive <laughs> plants, both of them. So, yeah, yeah and Terry, we recommend don't you just pull them. them. <laughs> don't identify them, pull them up and throw them away. <laughs> yeah, make sure that you pass the microphone back and forth for answering the questions if you don't mind. Thank you. All right, so um, invasive, you know, that, that's, a, that's always a problem. And so, Tell us about um, you know where like identifying invasives and I mean do you get a lot of disappointment when people are saying, hey what about this plant and you're like well so let me tell you about that plant. <laughs> well I think I'm going to run with this one since I'm also part of the Florida friendly team and I do yard reviews. Florida has native plants and invasive plants. Invasive plants are things that were either brought here, shipped here. But when you get right back down to it, native plants were also pretty much brought here, but they've been here long enough that they have naturalized and they become a native plant. When we're doing a yard review to get Florida friendly certification that you have a Florida friendly yard, we do look for invasive plants. Invasive plants choke out the native plants that we need to have that provide better food for the butterflies and the caterpillars. Some of the invasives do not provide the same food or any food at all because it's not really acclimated to the climate. It just takes over everything. Um, so we, we really encourage you to remove the invasives from your yards. One of our biggest projects that UF has handled is the air potato plant that I was talking about. It's choking out our forests. And there was a big research team there. We're lucky enough to have one of those people on our team in, Jacksonville now, he does commercial, but he helped develop the air potato beetle that is wiping out the air potato plant by destroying the leaves. It pokes, eats enough holes into the leaves that the plant can't not produce what it needs to produce from the sunshine and everything, and it dies out. The beetles fall to the ground, they kind of hibernate, come back up the next year. And if there's no food there, they do have a tendency to migrate to where they can find more air potato plants. So we really discourage the invasive plants because they take over a, a whole lot of things. And we do have a major list of them for Florida. You can get that from our website. Um, some of them are tallow. Evie's, or Evie, I miss Evie. Terry's gonna speak up for me this morning. I, you can go into the website. The University of Florida actually has a website where they've done an assessment of plants that are invasive. Uh, there's also FLEPSI, which is controlled through the state of Florida. So you can go into their website. Sometimes our, the University of Florida assessment is somewhat different than that particular one. But I want to make one clarification on Nancy's comment that there's invasives and there's natives. There's a lot of introduced species like camellias and azaleas and things like that that are wonderful landscape plants that are not invasive plants. So just because it's not native, 
doesn't mean that it's an invasive plant. So, so don't think that you've got to have 100% native plants in your landscape. You can have a mix of the two and still have a Florida friendly landscape. Yes. So, so go on uh, online. You can search for that assessment site by entering UFIFAS uh, assessment of non native plants, and it'll bring it up, and you can go in and look at pictures. Um, of the ones that are considered invasive in Northeast Florida or in North Florida. And uh, you, you might be surprised at some of them. The mimosa is one that we, um, that we see a lot of. Uh, the uh, mandina, people don't wanna get rid of their mandina, but it is in the family of bamboo. And if the, uh, if the birds take those berries out into the, out into the wild, that mandina could take over and crowd out, as Nancy said, crowd out the uh, native birds. Now, another wonderful feature of that website is we have a fantastic book that helps you, if you're going to change your landscape, tell you what's good for your area. And the website, you can go in and get that same information in the book now that we could get through the extension office. The whole book is online, page by page, and you can pick what's good for your yard based on putting in a little bit, little bit of information and it will come back right to the zone to your zip code and tell you what's gonna be good for your yard and bad for your yard or what might not work in your yard. You have to do a little research, but everything is identified with pictures. So if say if you want a medium sized tree, you're gonna tell it that's what you want. It's gonna direct you to choices and you can make your choice according to the placement in your yard and everything. So it's gotten a lot easier to use than it used to be with this new Ask IFAS feature. And one of the things we do before we do a Florida Friendly Yard Review is request that the homeowner get a um, soil sample and determine what the pH is in their, in their yard because that can really affect your plants. If you have a plant that is acidic and your yard is highly the other direction, that plant's not gonna be able to take up the food and nutrients that it needs to, to thrive. So you would have problems with it. A lot of the plants that we like here are acidic and it generally we're pretty acidic, but uh, it's always a good idea to check before you start planting new plants. And that service is free at the um, university office here in Jacksonville on, on McDuff Avenue. Great. All right, so we have a question um, from Kate Hurlbut, who is the president of the local chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. And so I'm going to replace the spotlight with her because she's going to show a plant that she has a question about identifying. And Kate, if you want to unmute yourself. If that works. Um, this is a plant that grows in my yard. It drives me nuts. And it grows along the ground. It has these pretty round leaves. It could almost make a ground cover. And it roots wherever it lands. And the reason I hate it is it has little seeds that smell horrible and they're super sticky. They will be on my socks when they come out of the dryer. Um, so what is it? And anything I can do, I mean, I don't want to use Roundup and it's driving me to try to pull it all out is prohibitively effortful. Could um, I ask you to hold that up a little more to the camera no, and I hold it still? We're going to try and get a screenshot of it. Hold it steady. Apparently, I can't hold it steady. That's the best I got. Okay, we have a snapshot of it. We're going to look it up. Yeah, it, it grows along the ground. And like I say, if it didn't have those seeds, it's pretty. Does it flower? Or is it just leaves? It's got it's got to have minuscule. I, I've never seen it flower, but it's got seeds all over it. So there must be some tiny flower that you just can't see. Not to touch it because I'm allergic to everything mm -hmm. green, apparently, but that little thing sticking up there, that's those are seeds. Okay, can you get that a little closer to the camera? And then hold it still. Thank you. Okay, I have to go wash my hands now because I gonna, touched well, it. <laughs> bring it back. We were trying to get a screenshot. <laughs> I get a rash if I touch anything. Good. Hold it still. We got it. I think yeah. hold still. There we go. We're okay. still. You know what it reminds me of a little snail plant. So trying to identify things through the Zoom is not the best way to go. Yeah, this is the first time we've tried to take pictures like this through Zoom. 
we're, we're going to make it work. Yeah, it's, it's all over in my, my lawn, which is mostly weeds with a little bit of grass. There's a lot of it. And like I said, the seeds will stick to your socks and they'll just stay there. And of course, they're all over the dog. So, you know, first is what is it? And then second, is there any easy way to get rid of it? Or do I just crawl around on my hands and knees and pull it out? Kate, you may have stumped us, uh, but uh, we'll uh, keep researching it. And meanwhile, I'm going to um, uh, take another question here. Um, Tiffany Davis, uh, president of the Garden Club of Jacksonville asks, would providing the location of the plant such as near the water or thriving in the sun help with identification? Well, it could because we have one weed in particular that's a major problem if you're familiar with torpedo grass and it's an aquatic weed, but it will also survive in your landscape bed. So it does, it proliferates more along the water's edge. Um, so that does help sometimes if it's a shade or a sun plant or if it likes wet or dry sites and would survive. So, you know, that one is the, you really need a good photo. So if you ever send pictures into the University of Florida, uh, you don't want, you want to send it as an attachment because then if you send it as an attachment, you can actually enlarge the photo. Uh, and we actually have a botanist that is excellent at the University of Florida. And if we can't identify it, if we have a good photograph, we can actually send it to him He's actually a master gardener in Alachua County and a botanist. So he works at the herbarium and he's better than any app that I have seen <laughs> for identifying <laughs> plants. So he did say that if we had a few house plants that we couldn't identify or something at the fair that he would be willing to help with identification. But I don't think he wants to be inundated with a hundred plant requests or anything for ID. Great. Sorry. Well, we have a plant that we've been growing in the um, office that Daniel is uh, bringing up ah. to show you and, uh, you know, figure out, hey, what's that plant? That's, a pep <laughs> that's a definitely a peperomia. <laughs> what peperomia, is it? A peperomia. And you can actually tell by these little seed pods and by the leaves. Uh, I'd have to look up exactly what species or something it is, but it's definitely a peperomia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that little plant and it yeah. should root We've managed from an to keep it alive. Leaf. <laughs> it should root from a leaf or anything. Actually, most of the peperomias will, will root from individual leaves versus the entire plant or a cut, stem cutting. So we might all snag a leaf or something on the way out. <laughs> I was looking to see. I would be willing to do that. I bought this plant from um, a, an actual another horticulture program uh, more than a year ago yeah. uh, from Cultivate. Away, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. That's a pretty plant. I'm willing to give you know, let it propagate. Or yes. did you want us to address yeah, a little yeah. bit on what to bring in? And, and then, then we will let you know we have the answer to that other question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Can we get you? Do you want to? Here. Take yeah. There you go. It's an alternanthera sessilis. It looks like that. Look it up online. The lady who uh, showed us that plant, it has the small white flowers. It has the stems with pretty long stems with leaves. It looks like it's a, it is a ground cover. So if it's not this one, it might be something in the same family. And I got that on the assessment site by looking for things from North Florida. And what was the name considered... again? I'm sorry? What was the name? Can you ask again? what the name was again. Yeah. Just repeat okay. the name. Okay. I'll spell it. How's that? Alternanthera, A L T E R N A N T H E R A, Cecilis, S C S S I L I S. And again, you can find that on that assessment of non native plants, and it mm -hmm. is considered uh, prohibited. No. <laughs> And now you know our secret. When you stump a master gardener, we go to the experts. <laughs> All right. We have a question in the audience. Hi, good morning. Um, I came in a couple of minutes late. Get a little closer late. if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I came in a couple of minutes late. Do you mind um, telling me uh, which phone app 
you you were recommending? It's not a phone. It's an app. Yeah, it's the phone app. Yes. Google Photos. I'm sorry. Google Photos. It's probably on your phone, and I can help you with it for a minute after we're we're after, through. Okay. So Google Photos. Google okay. Photos is the it, that's the plant. I no. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted to know the app that we were using. Yeah. Okay. Let me just clarify. So are you asking about the app that they were recommending? I was under the impression that there's that I know that there are apps that right. will identify mm -hmm. plants, but I know that typically you have to pay a monthly yes. fee. Yes. No. So I'm trying to avoid that if possible. Google photos. Okay. Take a picture of your plant. Okay. Open your Google photos app. Oh, it will ask, then you're going to put the picture in there and down at the bottom of the app, there's a thing that says lens and you hit the lens button and it takes another picture of that picture and searches the internet to find possible answers for you. It's not nice. always 100% correct, okay. but it will give you a world of opportunities to narrow it down. And I have it on my phone. Okay. I'll, I'll show you when we're finished, okay. um, kind of one-on-one -on, -one on how to work it. And if we'll look and see if you have that on your phone. Wonderful. I have one other question. You mentioned having the... Um pH in your yard tested. Um, I'm sorry, who would I contact for that? If you will give me your email address, I'll send you the instructions and the form that you fill out to submit with it. Perfect. Thank it you. Tells you everything you need to know. Afterwards, yes. Afterwards. Okay, thank you. Take care. In a world, world on Florida friendly, one of the reasons we so much want you to get pH testing is because it's also going to help you with fertilizing and keep you from over fertilizing your yard. Because when you over fertilize your yard, we all know where that goes. And we get that green algae that invades the river and does so much damage to the air and the water and everything that's growing along the river and in the river. And even us when we couldn't breathe when we had the last really big mess of that algae downtown several years ago. And I think Terry wants to talk for a minute about- Yeah, I'm just gonna have one more question here okay. that came online. Um, what is the name of the book that was mentioned earlier? So I think you specifically mentioned a specific book and they were just asking what that- specific, oh, That would have been your succulent book. Oh, there are, I have two succulent books. They are typically, they're not in print anymore. So if you look for them on Amazon, they could be very, very expensive. I think at one point they were 40 bucks. Yeah, you can hold that up. Um, this is, these are the two books that Jim Love suggested to me, and I've, I've used them just continually since I got them. Uh, on Amazon, they were as, as much as $250, but I did find some versions that were significantly less than that. I think I got them for around $50 or $60 a piece, and I felt like I got a real bargain because they're real hard to find. But I'm happy to have someone come and look in the book. It, uh, it, it isn't an easy one to find your plant in, but almost everyone you can see around here you're going to find in that book or either one of those books yeah. and i will tell you a good place to look for used books is the library book sale and the university branch library has a bookstore where they sell the used books they have racks just like in a regular store those are both good places to start looking for these and you might be able to check them out at the library it's possible you know uh there's succulents one and succulents two uh, you can come up and take a picture of the of the page so you know who the authors are and you can find it pretty easily that way at your local library. Great. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the horticulture show now and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see some of the things that they're talking about. Um, so for the first year ever, the Garden Club of Jacksonville is organizing the Greater Jacksonville Agricultural Fair. That is a mouthful horticulture show. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, we're very excited about this. And um, we hope that uh, everybody who is attending here in person and on Zoom and everybody else will uh, think about um, actually entering because there's really no uh, barrier to entry. It's free. And um, it's a really cool way to take part and, uh, you know, figure out, hey, you know, maybe I'll get some bragging rights with my, my beautiful plant. Um, so, uh, and I know that um, Nancy has a long history uh, with um, the fair, and uh, so yeah, and we're going to show um, this uh, handout that we have here in person. You can also go to our website 
um, to the blog post and download. This is the call for entries that um, has all the rules and everything. So this is the first and last page of it, um, but the last page has all the categories. So I believe there are 14 categories that you can enter in. And uh, did you wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm sure we'll all chime in on this, but this is also, I found one also on the Jacksonville Fair website. So it's under their catalog. They used to print a hard copy of the catalog. Now everything is online. So you just get the PDF and you can print it off as well. Um, I haven't worked as much with the Jacksonville Fair, but I used to actually go over to the Clay County Fair all the time and help judge the plants. The Master Gardeners actually were the ones that organized it along with, with some garden club members. But one of the things that we always look for, I mean, somebody has to, to go forth and divide things into the various categories, because if you look at the at the entry categories, I mean, it's divided into gesneriids or begonias or ferns or succulents. And we always had a pretty sizable bromeliad. I'm not sure I see bromeliads on here. Maybe it's in one of the categories or something. And Section we also, eight. okay. And we also used to it's have the top. professional versus amateur because we actually had some professionals actually entering uh, in the fair. So again, I'm not sure whether we have, uh, we have okay. separate categories. Okay. Okay. But some of the easiest things for you to, to look at when you're preparing your plants to bring in is just, you don't want something that you just went out to the store and bought. It was pretty obvious if somebody just went out and bought a plant and you hadn't actually nurtured that plant. So that's something that we would usually rate down the scale. Uh, the other thing is just the actual condition of the plant. So if you actually have dead leaves, dead flowers or anything like that, why not just clean it up? Because that's going to improve the, the actual grading of your plant if you do that. The pot itself should be clean as well. So you don't want uh, containers that are cracked or chipped or anything along that line. So just make sure that everything is in good shape. Make sure that if it's supposed to be in a blooming stage, you probably wouldn't want to bring something like the orchids, for instance, probably would not do very well if they were not blooming at the time that you brought those in. So it probably is not worth your effort from that standpoint. And it's kind of interesting that they've got a hydroponic uh, grouping too, which I think is kind of neat, you know, where basically any worthy entry can be entered in the hydroponic area. So you could have vegetables or herbs or, or ornamental plants or whatever in that particular category. So I think that's, that's kind of nice. Um, the fair pretty much takes care of your plants. You ladies would be taking care of those. So a lot of people are usually coming through and observing the plants that are on display. So they will be exhibited with their, their ribbons and so forth for some time so that people can enjoy them. So hopefully they should be pretty well maintained because most of the garden club members would be familiar with your particular plants, I would think. And while we're um, switching over, I just wanted to share that this is a, a prototype of the card that will be uh, what you enter. So when you arrive with your plant, you'll fill out this card um, and uh, we'll have some people on hand that will help you identify the plant. But um, hopefully today's program will um, help with that a little bit. Um, but you would put all your contact information in here and, uh, and then get a claim ticket at the bottom that you would keep with you so that you can come back and uh, pick it up um, after the fair. But uh, we really encourage everybody who is uh, participating in today's program and everybody else out there, tell your friends to, uh, to take part because it's a really fun way to get involved and, uh, and also to you know, maybe get some bragging rights. I know that um, our horticulture corner chair, Wally Eriks, has um, entered a lot of plants in the past and has done very well. So uh, you can ask him about his experience. If there's something that you're not sure what it is, be proactive and try and get it identified prior to going to the fair. And it's going to save them a lot of trouble, I think. So reach out to people that are experts in the field or contact the extension office by sending some really good quality pictures as JPEGs. 
uh, don't have them embedded into your into the uh, email or whatever it is that you're sending. That's one thing that our botanist always complains about. He wants to be able to blow them up and enlarge them so he can see if there's little hairs on the leaves or, or whatever to help with the identification process. So try and try and have them identified prior to, and a lot of plants have changed names. So I think they put the scientific names on them and there's been a lot of changes in the field. Uh, so we, I don't know, uh, you'd almost have to go into a particular site or something just to confirm that that name is accurate at this point, so. All right, any other questions? I think uh, Ann has one. Ann Sauer, our first vice president. This is not a question, but it's a testimonial of the great work that the Extension Office does here. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a neighbor's fence that I wanted to cover and a couple of other areas I wasn't quite sure about. So I called your office and you sent a team of three people out to look at my yard. I think, Eileen, you were one of them. Um, anyway, I want to report that your suggestion for a passion flower vine, oh my goodness, it's like it would like to eat my garage. <laughs> it's all over the fence. It's a huge long fence. It has bright red flowers. It attracts butterflies. And it was just a wonderful recommendation. You were providing a, a place for the butterflies to lay their eggs. I mean, by having a large amount of foliage, a lot of those eggs are going to hatch because the lizards and other bees and things will get them. Uh, we'll take them and eat them. But if you if you've got enough and you've got a large enough spot, you will get some either some. Um, uh, yeah, I would recommend it for anybody oh, yeah. who has an area they want to cover. I have yeah. to get out there with my clippers and say, not quite so much, please. <laughs> the passion vine. There, there are several. The one that seems to do the best in my yard is the purple one. And the flower, to me, is one of the most beautiful flowers in the world. It's gorgeous. Just It, it looks like someone fashioned a... Uh, it doesn't look... It doesn't it look looks natural. like an alien. It looks, it looks yeah, it looks fake. <laughs> yeah. Purple one for me is the most prolific, but the red is gorgeous if you can get it to grow. It's gorgeous. Yeah, you put it in the ground. You will get you will get a lot of volunteers, but they're easily identified if you don't want to pull them up and throw them away or give them to somebody else. Share them. <laughs> That's what we do when we stick them in a pot and, and then sell them at some of our plant sales. But uh, you might check the plant sale at the garden club in April, right? Uh, they'll probably have some. I would be surprised if they didn't, but you could, you could probably get them at some of the nurseries around town as well. You could call and ask if they have them. If it's in a pot, any time is good to plant, but it, you know, it's best to plant that plant in the spring because it's gonna die back in the winter. It almost always dies back for me, but it will come back from the ground and the roots, and if you develop the place for it to climb, it'll come back in that spot, but you'll find them elsewhere around. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm do not have, good with this. Do we have any more questions in the audience? And I don't see any more. Um, I just have one more comment, as having been the, the years ago, it's not been very recently, I was the uh, privileged to be the chairperson of the horticulture show here, that was put on with the um, with the flower show in conjunction with that, and our group of ladies in this club and now gentlemen have gorgeous plants, and we always had beautiful shows, and um, we gave prizes, not prizes, but ribbons, and I think there were prizes for the grand prize winners. But the fair gives you monetary prizes, so there's a there's a good boost for you. <laughs> That's right. All right, and then uh, Kate uh, chimed in on uh, Zoom and said that the uh, the native passion vine is purple, and the native one doesn't die back. So um, there you go. Yeah. Right. 
Okay. Well, um, I'm going to do a couple of like closing uh, remarks. Do you have any last minute um, words of wisdom for us, Nancy, Terry? No, just remind you one more time to call the office if you have questions. There's always master gardeners there that are willing to help with just about anything. And we have, um, let's say everything, we have horticulture, we have trees. As you noticed this morning, if the master gardeners can't get an answer, we go up to the next level in the office. And if they can't get an answer, they go to the next level above them, all the way up through to Gainesville to get answers for you. We try and answer everything we can whenever we can. And, and give you the assistance that you're looking for. Um, I did leave some cards on the back table. There's a lovely bookmark and a business card. Gives you all of our websites, our phone number. Uh, um, it's lonesome on those phones if you don't call. So I keep saying, I've sat there for three hours on my shifts and not a phone call. It's like, oh, somebody call me, anybody call me. Even if it's not for us, call me. <laughs> All right, well, that's good advice. And um, we are adding um, that information to the chat if you're on Zoom. And uh, we are recording this program and it will be on our blog um, this week. And so all of that contact information will also be there. Um, once again, I wanna thank Nancy and, oh, pardon me, I've got something flying in my face. Um, Nancy and Terry and Aileen, um, for you know, being fantastic uh, sounding boards and, uh, you know, you know, very uh, good uh, resources. And uh, please, you know, call them, make use of uh, this really great service that uh, U of I has, you know, uh, makes available to us. Um, all right, so while I still have you here, I just wanna give a couple of shout outs to some future programming. Um, the next Horticulture Corner program is called House Plants and Health, and it will be November 2nd, I believe. Yes, and um, it is with Talitha Smith-Green, who owns a store called Rooted with Love, and she does um, a lot of uh, work in the area of uh, wellness and uh, plants. Um, so I think that will be a great program and one that uh, you'll want to take part in. And then after that, the next Horticulture Corner in December, um, yes, what is it? Uh, yeah, December 7th. Uh, it's called Dig It, and it's about soil health. Um, you know, you can't grow good things without healthy soil. And uh, Alan Skinner of Soil Life Organics, which works very closely with White Harvest Farms um, to grow beautiful vegetables like the ones you're seeing here. Um, so find out how you can make your soil healthy so you can grow beautiful things like this. And then we have our open house coming up on October 21st. It's going to be a great celebration. And I look forward to all the great programming we have this year. So that is October 21st. Come and join us, please. And we have several budding gardeners coming up. The next one is just next weekend. It's called Spiders Aren't Scary. <laughs> I know some of you are still scared of spiders, but spiders are really good um, and uh, great neighbors to have in your yard and garden. And uh, this will be um, a little lesson about that. We have folks from uh, University of Florida Entomology Department who are gonna come and present at that, along with great art programs and um, a planting exercise as well. Uh, and then the next Bedding Gardeners after that is called Winter Veggies. And we are working with White Harvest Farms and Clara White Mission to uh, plant some uh, great vegetables. And they're even gonna be cooking up some greens for everybody to taste. And that's gonna be a great program as well. And our Fun with Flowers is back, and the first one is next week on Color Basics. There's just a couple of uh, spots left, so if you hurry, you can still get in. Um, and it's with Alicia Palm and Carrie Strait of the Daughter's Flower Shop, which is right around the corner. And the one after that is with Jacksonville Flower Market, and it's holiday decor, so you'll get the chance to make some beautiful um, table decor that uh, you can display at your home or give us a gift. And of course, it's time for our pecan sale again. And so we're selling pecans. They are as fresh as you can get them. They harvest them just a couple of weeks before we get them here in person. So order now and they'll be in usually by the last week of November or the first week of December. So just in time for the holidays. And uh, we always do surveys for all of our programs because we really wanna hear from you about how we're doing, what you thought of this program, what programs you'd like to see in the future. So we're going to put that link um, in the uh, Zoom program, and we'll send it out to everybody this week and ask you to please take it. It just takes a minute or two, uh, but we really appreciate your feedback. 
And I think I want to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund once again for making programs like this possible and thank everybody here, all of our speakers, my colleague Daniel and everyone who's here in person and on Zoom for making this a great program because if you weren't here, we'd just be talking to ourselves and that is no fun at all. So thank you everybody. Have a great rest of your day and a great week and we'll see you again soon. Bye.